on. You are the left. Oh, you wait till it's Saturday. You're on. You're on. Oh, I'm live. You're okay. <laughs> you're on, Vince. I'm making jokes about Saturday start for everybody. Good evening to everyone here at Mueller Hall and to everyone who's watching us on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook. Uh, it's great to be back. I think it's been two years since we've been March 2020 was the last time we were here. Uh, but before we begin tonight's proceedings and listen to Sarah's wonderful talk on machine learning in astronomy and using it to find fast flaring stars. Uh, I'd like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the others past and present and extend the, that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, for those watching along at home on YouTube and Facebook, as always, uh, if you're enjoying the stream tonight and if you're enjoying the presentation, feel free to donate some stars or stickers. Um, every little donation helps. It uh, goes a long way to us bringing you these streams. Uh, and following Sarah's presentation, we have uh, Ken Buckland, who's going to give us a tour of the December night sky. But first... Oh, our president. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well... Welcome back. Here we are after 21 months, all back face to face. And it's, it is... What, now it works, does yeah, it? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so it is wonderful to be back here, actually to see some old friends, and uh, it's great to be back. So we have uh, Dr. Sarah Webb, talking to us tonight with her PhD. Congratulations, Sarah. That's <laughs> it's, it's a huge effort. Having steered one, th one son through a master's, a PhD is another level above that again. So, fantastic. So, Sarah's going to talk about these fast flaring stars. They're slightly different from the uh, FRBs, the fast radio bursts, but um, just as much interest in them, and uh, I'm sure we will know a great deal more about them very shortly. So, Sarah, without more ado, over to you. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, if you do like fast radio bursts, so some of my PhD was also on that, so you can ask me questions at the end if you want to chuck some ch cheeky radio astronomy in there. Um, but thank you very much for the introduction. And hi, Mum, who's on stream at home in Queensland. Hopefully she got it working. If not, we'll never know. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I'm so excited to, yeah, take you through blood, sweat and tears um, from my PhD. But this, this, these projects that I'm about to present to you are... Oh, like that? Sorry. Um, I feel like a pop diva. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, these projects are really, really exciting and true and um, really near and dear to my heart because of the program that we, that we work on. And so I thought I'd start off with just a little bit of an introduction to um, telescopes. So I'm sure all of you, you all have fantastic access to your own telescopes and I'm sure you all have a favourite professional telescope out there. Um, but in the world, I think a lot of people um, fail to realise just how many professional telescopes that are continuously taking data night after night or day after day, if it's a radio telescope, um, across the globe. And it really is remarkable the amount of facilities that we have access to both in Australia and via international collaborations. Um, and really, the, the universe is our oyster. If you want to look at something, you can look at it in any wave band that, that you desire. However, the one problem with having so many telescopes in, in, in the world is that they all look at different places. So you can imagine we've got all of these telescopes looking in many, many different places. They're looking in different wave bands. So, for example, you might have radio telescopes, optical, infrared, UV 
they're all a little bit different. They've all got their own special uh, special band that they're looking at. And you're all keenly aware that some things you can see in certain bands and some things you can't. And this makes it really difficult when you're trying to find new sources in the universe that really need a full spectrum, the full black body radiation of the source to understand exactly what it is. And when you have telescopes looking at different regions of the sky for different science cases, it means that you only get little patches of data here and there. So you might go to a place in the universe that might have been looked at. There's only a few of that have been really deeply studied, like the Hubble Deep Field, tiny, tiny little patch of the sky that has the type of coverage that we need in order to discover new and exciting things. And so ideally, you want to be able to coordinate where all of the telescopes all of the different wave bands, all the different types of facilities can look in one patch, at least for a little bit of time during any given year. And the advantage of having telescopes looking in one patch of the sky is that wavelength coverage that you get. So you get all of this information about a certain patch of sky for the exact same time period. Because another tricky thing with transient astronomy, which just means things that are changing over time, is that if you have a supernova go off or an FRB go off, that uh, source only exists in a very specific point in time in the universe. If you go back two years later, that data that you gather, it might be from a different telescope, but it's not going to tell you the information that you needed those two years ago. It's really, really tricky. And that is something that as transient astronomers, we really struggle with is typically uh, back in historical data is actually understanding exactly what everything is without the wave bands. And so this is where the Deeper, Wider, Faster program was conceived. And I, I believe um, my PhD supervisor, Jeff Cookie, might have given a talk to you guys a couple of years ago on the Deeper, Wider, Faster program. And it, the idea is to collaborate all of the different types of telescopes across the wave bands into looking at one patch of sky for a certain period of time. And this is actually incredibly tricky to do. Um, it, it, it turns out living on a globe is wonderful for gravity and, and you know, life as we know it, but rubbish <laughs> if you're trying to coordinate telescopes across the Pacific Ocean or across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it gets really tricky. And what you can actually see, um, which I always love when American friends come down here and realise that the moon looks slightly different. They, they all look so confused that our moon is different. But our position, our angular position of the sky that we can see changes depending on your longitude and your latitude. Um, so com com coordinating different telescopes is really tricky, but Jeff is a legend and he managed to make it work. And so the ultimate goal of DWF is to offer this coordinated, simultaneous, multi-wavelength observation. And the key to this is you need really wide field imaging. So when we say that, we need a decent chunk of the sky. Um, it might surprise some people that some of the, the incredible optical facilities or imaging facilities that we have around the world only focus on very, very tiny bits of the sky. They have very small, um, uh, a very small field of view. So you might only get one galaxy in there. If you're trying to do a statistical survey, you need hundreds of thousands of galaxies, not just one. So... The next step is that you need to have it in real time. So yes, it's fantastic if you can coordinate all the different telescopes to get data from the sky and then store it on a computer. And maybe you'll look at it two, three years later, or you'll get a PhD student to look at it, you know, eventually. This is good. You might have captured something fantastic there. But if something really rare has happened, say an, an FRB, we know how rare they are to try find an optical or any other counterpart that's not in radio. Um, you really need to know that something has happened to be able to get on it with other telescopes immediately. So ideally, you want to be able to take your data off the sky, have it processed through a computer, and within minutes, know exactly what's in your data which sounds easier than it is because, as I said, we're using these wide field deep imaging, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit later on, but each image has over three to 500,000 sources in it. And if you're trying to figure out what source has changed or what source is new, it's a lot of computational power. And so this was a key element in DWF, was designing these real-time processes um, to be able to give us identification of things that might be interesting. And then this leads directly into that rapid response. So if you see something that is interesting, that might be your Nobel Prize or your Nature paper, you want to get your, your other telescopes right on it, right away, get the data and be able to analyse it, um, which is something that also takes a lot of coordination because with professional um, uh, telescopes around the world, depending on what nation you're in, the telescope proposal uh, sequence 
is all over the shop. So here in Australia, um, for some of the telescopes up at Siding Springs, we have two proposals a year. So you have an A and B semester, a bit like a university or a, a schooling term. Nice and easy. If you want time in June, you got to propose in December. You know that. However, for some European telescopes, if you want time in June, you need to propose last June and you need to know exactly what you want to look at. So proposing for time, for follow-up time, is really tricky to understand exactly what telescopes are going to be scheduled when and where do you need to look. Um, so again, Jeff is an absolute legend and has figured out the art to proposing to some of the best facilities around the world, including VLT um, and, and other telescopes like Swift up in space. And finally, you need longer term cadence observations. So you might look at one patch of the sky, you find your Nobel Prize, it's all well and good. You need to go back and confirm what you saw was exactly what you thought it was. So for transient astronomy, the most things that we see are supernovae, kilonovae, things that are dying, they fade away, and we can confirm that they've, they've faded away, their colours have changed, so how hot they are has changed, and we can try model exactly what they were. If you don't go back and confirm what you saw, uh, you, you might bamboozle yourself and you don't want to accidentally publish something without confirming exactly what it was. So you need to coordinate those, those follow-up observations. And this is all, all done in DWF, which is pretty amazing. And it really filled a niche for a very, very long time in transient astronomy, because you're probably familiar with very large surveys like SkyMapper, ZTF, these very large um, full sky surveys in certain wave bands. Um, but they don't have other facilities following along or didn't in until very, very recently. Um, and so being able to coordinate this back in 2014 when it first started was, was pretty mind-blowing and really great that it actually happened. So let's dive a little bit into the transient universe um, because I personally think that we live in an insane time that 100 years ago, no one knew that we lived in a galaxy. Hubble was still figuring out what nebula were. Um, no one knew the universe was expanding or that there was anything called dark matter or dark energy. We have learnt so much in the last 100 years in terms of science, just in general, biology, chemistry, physics and astronomy, that it really is mind-blowing that in the last two decades, we have learnt 10 times fold of what, of what we used to. Um, and so before the 17th century, so quite a long time ago now, they used to be able to detect galactic supernovae and so we actually have fantastic records of some of the ancient Chinese astronomers noticing that there was a new guest star, something had gone burst, it was very bright, they recorded it, had no idea exactly what it was and it wasn't until about, um, you know, two, three hundred years ago that they realised that these things were occurring, you know, where stars were and then suddenly that star would disappear. And then it wasn't until just 50 to 60 years ago that we started to discover that it wasn't just these changing stars, so it wasn't just things appearing that looked like a star, they faded away. It was all these other things in different wavelengths, not just optical, but there were things that were only in the radio that you couldn't see in the optical, um, things like pulsars. You have X-ray bursters, which are personally some of my favourite things in the universe. So this is when you have a black hole orbiting a big, fluffy, red giant star, and you get really insane amounts of X-ray bursts coming out of it. You can barely see the other star in the optical because of how dusty it is. It, it ends up blocking out most of the light and you can only see it in infrared or in X-ray. Um, and they're just insane. Things like this you would never have considered were out there unless you had the telescopes and the abilities to look at it. Same comes for gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts, you probably know the history. The US sent up a satellite to try to figure out if if anyone, uh, cough, cough, the Soviet Union were doing any nuclear bomb testing out in the Pacific. So this was back, it was in the Cold War. We needed to understand were there any radionuclides going around the atmosphere in the Earth. And a telltale sign of atomic bombs is gamma ray bursts and gamma ray activity. And so they sent up these satellites pointed at Earth to monitor Earth to make sure we were doing the right thing here on Earth. And they started to discover all of these gamma ray bursts that were not coming from Earth. They were actually traveling through the Earth. That's how powerful they were. And they found an entire two populations, long and short gamma ray bursts. And this is something entirely non-predicted at that time. We thought, yes, high energy rays and um, 
and events would probably happen in the universe, but we didn't realise just how often they happened and from the different progenitors. And it was this kind of serendipitous discovery through different, um, through different means that have actually led us to knowing a lot of these different things. Um, and then, of course, uh, the wonderful Kilanovi, which we've only ever seen one in 2017, and that really is the poster child for multi-wavelength astronomy, multi-messenger astronomy. So not only are you seeing it in all of the wave bands, you're even seeing it in gravitational waves, which is just brilliant. So, whoops, a daisy. There we go. So if we were, I know this looks terrifying, but I, I promise it's not. So were to just do something really basic and look at things uh, based on how bright they are, how bright do they get, how do they last. So things that are really bright are up in the top right, things that are really short time duration are over on my side. And we end up being able to break down the transient space into a heap of different events. And same thing, we don't need to break down all of them, but we do need to realise that some of these very exciting ones, like gamma ray bursts, x-ray bursts, fast radio bursts and pulsars, all of them were discovered by serendipitous um, surveys. So they weren't targeted. No one set up a radio telescope knowing that a pulsar should exist out there looking for a pulsar. It was this discovery through data looking for other things, which is really, really awesome that we find things, but it means that if we're going to discover other characteristics of these more rare um, transient events, we need to be really targeted and specific in what we're looking for because we can't just rely on good luck all of the time because I don't know if we're going to get that lucky. So then we look to the left a bit where we have those, those longer duration events of supernovae and tidal disrush, uh, disruption events. All of these things, they last for weeks, months and years. They, you could go out tonight, see a supernovae, come back in a couple of months and it will still be there. So they are great for surveys that image the sky, go away for a day, a two, a week, whatever it might be, come back and image the sky. So they're much easier to find and much easier to characterise, but all of the good bits that we really want to understand is over in this light, light blue section. And if we want to understand it, we need to use DWF to get a multi-wavelength approach. So I've talked to you off about all of the different all of the different multi-wavelengths, but we're going to talk about the optical sky tonight and we're going to talk about one of the main drivers behind DWF, which is a telescope um, called the CTIO 4 metre Blanco telescope and there's an instrument on it called the dark energy camera. Now this camera is probably, in my humble opinion, the most beautiful camera to ever exist. It is absolutely ginormous, wider than my arm, 60 CCDs, all of them are 4K by 2K. The, the actual resolution of the images that you get off it is just astounding. And this is really what cameras were made to do, was to look at the universe. And so this is how big the, the deck cam footprint is if we if we the chart in the sky. You could fit four full moons across it. Lots and lots of sky. If we were to count how many sources are in any given field, it can be over a million, depending how close you are to the galactic plane. So it's an insane amount of things to look through and DWF we we don't uh, we don't muck around we take an image every 20 seconds so we're taking an image 20 seconds every every 20 seconds and you want to map how is something changing from that 20 seconds to the next one and build something called a light curve so how are the sources changing over time being able to interrogate those light curves is incredibly difficult um, and requires some requires some fun, <laughs> some fun computational uh, things. So an overview of some of the data I worked with in the past couple of years. I had 17 different field pointings, 15,000 images, I think 5 million individual unique sources. Um, yeah, lots and lots of things. If you were to physically inspect each source for a couple of minutes a day, it would take you about 30 years to get through everything. It's not good. That, um, I didn't have 30 years, so we needed to get smart and creative. Um, and that's where the machine learning comes into it. So this is a humble brag that eventually in the next 12 months or so, all of these sources, all of these light curves will be available free. So if you want to interrogate any of the data and find weird, wonderful things, whether it's flaring stars, supernovae, AGN, you can. Um, when, when this comes out, I can let you know because it is going to be really fun to go through all the data because we have not even scratched the surface with our analysis. Okay. So back to light curves. So 
we have all of these sources, all of these light curves. So how bright is it over time? How is it changing? How do you find the interesting things? Because you can predict what you want to look for. Maybe you're very interested in supernovae or maybe you like flare stars and we have a pretty good understanding of what they should look like. Um, but we don't want to bias ourselves. So something we talk about in um, astronomy or just in general data science is looking for anomalies. Um, so if you have a model of something, that's great. You know that model, but do you know how well you don't know that model? So that unknown known. Uh, and we really want to explore everything that could possibly be interesting without leaving anything behind because we're very greedy. Um, we, we don't want just the, the stars and the supernovae. We want to find the counterpart to the FRB, which I wish I could present one here tonight, but we have not found one yet. <laughs> so you want to pull out all the good stuff. You want to get, get rid of the noise, get rid of the background, pull out the good stuff. And when you have 5 million sources, it gets a little bit tricky. So this is where we jump into the machine learning. So you've probably heard machine learning and AI chucked around a lot. And basically, it is getting a computer to solve a problem for you. And there's a couple of different ways you can do it. So there's two base types of machine learning. One that's supervised, so you know what you're looking for and you train a machine to look for those known things. And unsupervised, where you are really letting the machine decide what is different in your data. We went with the unsupervised learning. And an example of how um, a, a particular technique called clustering might work is we might break down a light curve. So say we have a light curve, brightness over time, and we can break it down into two values. So instead of having 50 values describing the light curve, we might just see what is the maximum change in brightness, how long did that change in brightness last? So we have two values describing each light curve. We can then plot them in parameter space, just two parameters. We can plot them up and we can see here with our eyes, we know that there's two different populations there. Us humans are really, really good at finding patterns um, that, that look like groupings. However, we can't do it with mass amounts of data and this is where we trust the machine to do it for us. So the machine might go through and say, yes, these look like two distinct patterns. I'm going to draw a box around it. This is your cluster. These, these are two different things you can now take it and, and analyze it. And this is essentially what we did for our data, except instead of two parameters, um, we, we went hardcore. We did 25. And trying to visualize parameter space in 25 dimensions, how each light curve with 25 dimensions interacts with each other light curve with 25 dimensions is really, really mind boggling. And this is just a nice little high dimensional drawing trying to explain how things kind of inter interconnect. And it's something that us, like us humans, we can't picture how this higher dimensional space works. We just have to trust that the distance metrics that we're using, so how do we draw a line from A to B in this higher dimensional space is working. And there's some ways we can, we can figure out if we're doing that right. Um, but essentially, you're throwing it up into higher dimensional space. You can pretend that you're in a sci-fi. Everything's in the higher dimension and you hope that you are finding the clusters right. And there's some really smart ways to do this. So the dimensions that you're creating are, is something called feature space. So you have a light curve, you might even have an image, anything you want, you have data. And you pick a certain number of things that describe it very well. So we had our light curves and we picked some, some values that described it. We picked 25 values. So, and, and, uh, so some examples are here. So how much did the magnitude change? You know, how slopey was the actual light curve? What was the mean variance? Was it scattering? All these things that can really be described with one number. So each feature has one number. And what's brilliant about this is you can normalize all of your numbers across all of your features, chuck them up into that higher dimensional space and find relationships between them. So for example, if we have uh, a light curve that shoots up very high and falls back down, that shape, which we've described in a couple of different numbers, is very unique to that type of light curve. That is not going to be mistaken with a very flat light curve. Um, and we use something called hierarchical. That's the first time I've said that word in a talk without, without messing it up, hierarchical <laughs> density-based clustering. Um, and so basically what you say is that we know there's going to be a lot of different things. We don't know how many different things there be, so we don't want to say there's going to be five of each because then the machine learning algorithm looks for groups of five. We want to say there's going to be X number of things 
you tell me the groups, which is really a great way because then the algorithm comes back and goes, yeah, I found three groups um, of things that look very similar. Check them out, see what you think. And so we need to sanity check ourselves because again, we're doing this in the higher dimension, the sci-fi. We need to bring us back down to earth. And a way we can do that is by then those 25 dimensions and projecting them back down onto two. And we do this using um, something called a TSNE. So you can imagine, takes those 25 dimensions, plots them back down into two and makes, makes it easier for our little brain to figure it out. Because beforehand, I would have no idea if I trusted what it was saying. And this is a good example of what that might look like. So you see that big gray blob there. That is every source that is unchanging. And what TSNE does is things that are really tightly clustered in that high dimensional space, it spreads them out in lower dimensions for you. Um, so you can interrogate how, cl how closely they are. That little green blob up there, they are all our variable stars. Uh, and you can see that in this two dimensional feature, they sit really nice with each other. They're nice and close together. We also have a few other things. We have purple and black. Um, to see that these things really do exist in some type of space differently to each other. Uh, and it's all, it is all a little bit tricky, but we trust the process. And in the end, it spits out folders with hundreds of thousands of light curves, and all of them look identical to each other. So you open one folder, there are your variable stars. One folder, there's your flare stars. Another folder, your flat boring things, which is amazing. And this means that now we can grab those folders and have human power look at them uh, with our own eyes without wasting precious amounts of time. So some things that we might find is light curves, so things that aren't changing, that's good. Um, we don't want everything to change in the universe. It would be a very scary place if stars were dying all of them. We have variable sources, so things like RLRI and Delta um, they have beautiful light curves and they can be separated out. We also can find things that have really faint detection. So something that's sitting teetering just at that detection limit. So in a light curve, it might pop up and then pop back down. It's able to classify that and, and pop them all in one folder. And then we get a couple other things which are you know, not real. So they're either on the edge of CCDs or they're cosmic rays. It's this last one that we actually care about. So there's another grouping, something that it can't put in a folder. It's called unclusterable, or they, the, the algorithm in machine learning terms, you call it noise. It's not noise. This is the interesting stuff. It is the word that it could be for it. Um, it is the brilliant stuff. This is where you find things that are so unlike every other thing, it can't figure out where to put it. And that's where you want to look. You want to look for your weirdos out there, because um, that's where you find really cool science. So when we do this, we then use a beautiful interface that was designed um, by one of my colleagues to chuck in the light curves and run another machine learning algorithm on it called an isolation forest. So what you can imagine is we're giving it a group and then we just want it to tell us how different are they all to each other. So some are going to be very similar to each other, some are very, very different. We do this with the unclusterable ones to find the ones that are truly so different they stand out. And then we can physically look at them and interrogate the physically. So some just very quick results. Something like, it was almost 90,000 light curves. We could chuck it into... We had looked at every known variable that there was. We had discovered a heap of known variables that other surveys hadn't tagged as variable yet. Um, and we even found ultra-fast and classical flares. Now, the ultra-fast and the classical flares are the ones we're going to care about next. So the classical flare... Oh, I don't think I put a picture of the classical flare. It's because it's not interesting. Classical flare, it goes up, it comes down, and it takes about 20 minutes. The ultra-fast flare is the thing that is incredibly interesting, which is this guy here. And you can see that it jumps very, very quickly and falls back down. And now each of these spots is only 20 seconds. So this happens in less than three minutes, three to five minutes. You have something jump in magnitude and fall back down. The reason these are very, very interesting is because on a typical transient survey, if you're taking photos of the night sky, you might take a photo, come back half an hour later to get your other epoch of the sky. Things like this can trip up systems that are looking for, for transient sources and they end up wasting time. So yes, they're interesting for other scientific reasons, but for a transient astronomer, um, they're not so great. I'm characterize them so you can predict when they're going to happen. 
So let's chat a little bit about flare stars. So flare stars are fantastic. So basically any star on the main sequence has the potential to flare. The stars that flare the most are the ones the convective envelopes, all the ones that are lower down on the main sequence, so the smaller stars. Um, what a flare is, we can imagine that most most of the stars in the main sequence have very, very strong magnetic fields. Um, and you can see them when you look at um, through a solar telescope and you see the beautiful like joining of, of the magnetic fields and you see the plasma running around it. What happens when you have uh, very big magnetic fields, ones that can actually bump into each other, so you can imagine you have many of those things coming out of the sun, many accelerated particles, if they snap into each other, magnetic fields, depending on if you're south or like whether you're a south or a north pole, you can repel each other and create this break in the field. And so you can imagine all of a sudden you've got all of these very, very high energy particles that are just living their life on the surface of the star. We break that magnetic field line and they accelerate out at almost the speed of light, at like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, the speed and they're particles, they're not light. Um, it's very, very energetic. Um, and it releases a lot of energy and a lot of radiation. So some of my favourite sci-fi movies talk about giant solar flares and we're overdue for a solar flare and it's going to be the end of the world. Um, not the case, we're going to be okay. But our sun is one of those stars and it flares quite frequently, but they're very low energy flares. They can, however, affect us if they uh, build up to the next energy level. And this is, uh, I'll show you a plot later on where our star is actually very, very tame in terms of the energy that it, that it emits when we have these tiny little solar flares. So what we want to interrogate with flares is we want to figure out how long do they actually last? Because we saw that very quick flare before, very, very quick. You know, is that common or is that not common? And two, until, until my most recent paper, there was only one other paper that had found these very quick five minute flares and was able to categorize them. And so we didn't know whether they were a different class of flare, whether they were uh, occurring because of a different mechanism. Maybe it wasn't the same magnetic reconnection that was creating the flare, um, but we're pretty certain it is now. But that was one of our motivations. We wanted to understand that. We also wanted to figure out what is the flare rate or how flary are stars over galactic declination. So if we have our galaxy plane, the further you go out from the galaxy, you find less flares. Um, why is that? We want to confirm that it's because of an astrophysical reason, not because of uh, an observational region reason. Um, and I will uh, give you all the answers shortly. Turns out it is because of hard science, which is lovely. We want to figure out energy distribution. So again, we want to find itty bitty tiny flares. So these 10 to the 20, 23 ergs. So these are the type of things that happen on our sun. We call them nano flares. They're quite small. Super flares, however, are several orders of magnitude higher. So they can be up to 10 to the 38 ergs. And this is the type of energy that if this happened on the sun, very, very rare that it would, but if it did happen on the sun, it could rip an ozone column depth out of out of our atmosphere and cause real harm and real um, havoc at the side of the Earth that was facing the sun when this happened. Um, that's how powerful it is that it could literally rip some of the atmosphere away with it. Not going to happen, touch wood, um, but they do happen on other stars. And it's fascinating because if we start to think about life around other stars, you know, are we very special here? Are we in a very great solar system and my opinion is yes we're in a wonderful place to live because our star is less flary. When we start to look at other places though for life we tend to look around stars called M dwarfs so there's very tiny stars they have very large convective envelopes very large magnetic fields they tend to flare the most and it's probably not a great place um, to live if you are an organism. And then finally this brings us to answering what type of spectral type so our G star is it a good place to live or you know should we be around an m dwarf ideally if you're looking for life where where should you look and so we were able to answer all of these questions so the sample that we did we grabbed everything within five sex thanks to gaia gaia is just a brilliant survey within a certain region um, which means that you can grab a volume or distance limited sample very easily we grabbed all of them over 12 
field, so across galactic declinations, um, and we're able to then look for some flares. So I'm going to show you a couple of different types of flares. So this one here is an example of a classical flare. And this one is a giant rise. This changes six magnitudes um, in about two minutes, and then it takes much longer than 30, 30 minutes to fall back down. We, we actually don't even capture it when it gets back down to its recent state. Um, but a flare like this would be a classical flare because it rises and it falls pretty exponential. You could model that very easily. Fairly nice. It's physically very nice. Um, and this is one of the largest flares that we found. And this is one of the ones that are pretty rare, um, but one of the ones that is very, very interesting for the fact that it could be a world destroyer. The other type of flares that we get are something called complex flares. And, and you can see here, this is a bit janky, it's um, ratty. And we don't exactly know what's happening. This is much harder to model. And so if you're looking for things um, analytically, again, this is why you want to use machine learning because trying to model that is very difficult. Um, what we think though is happening is that it's multiple flares concurrently happening in this very similar region on the star. And we get all these little bursts um, and, until it falls down. And we don't exactly know why, and we don't, we don't fully understand if there's different types of complex flares. So they're very interesting. The final type of flare that we get, ones that I showed you before, which are these very ultra-fast flares. Um, so this one, again, three minutes and it's gone. Um, but it spits out a pretty decent amount of energy. So it could, it could um, emit 30% of its normal energy extra 30% within a couple of seconds, um, which is a lot of energy. And it's really impressive because they tend to come from smaller stars. So just quickly, by fitting, you can imagine we can fit lines underneath the, the, uh, the flare itself. So we can figure out how much energy is it let off compared to its quiescent or its base state, and then figure out how much extra energy is that flare letting off. So for that monster flare, very large one I showed you, it's letting off um, just shy of, you, you, sorry, just over 1,100 times as energy as it normally would in that time period, which is a lot of energy. It's very excessive. Normally, flares might let out 5-10% of the amount of energy um, at any given time. So in our sample, we found just under 100 flares across 80 stars, and no surprise, majority of them were from M dwarfs, so those very low mass, high convective envelope stars, which was very nice because it meant we could do some really good modeling. So this plot here is one of my favorites because it uh, gives us a bit of insight into the different types of environments you might live around if you're uh, on a planet around a star. So what we can see here, those little Xs, over on this side here that are labeled solar class MX flares. These are the largest flares that we see on our sun. So these are the ones that are considered um, dangerous. So if we have astronauts out on a spacewalk um, and there's an X class flare, that can get um, very dangerous things happening. So they are the worst flares that we see on our sun. However, if you look across the, that integrated energy, we get a lot worse flares across different types of stars. And we tend to see that all of these stars that have uh, the, the higher energy flares, um, they tend to come from a lower mass star, which we'll get to it in a different plot. What was really interesting, though, is that we could model how far away from the galactic plane are you? And long story short, uh, we tend to find more frequently flaring stars, younger stars, in the galactic plane. They haven't had time to move out of the galactic plane. They haven't had time to uh, slow down with their rotation and to do something called magnetic braking. Um, and they're more flary than the older stars. Our older stars tend to be higher on the galactic plane because of their velocities, which we can, we can model in a little bit. So it's just a nice confirmation that uh, closer to the galactic plane, if you are an M dwarf, you're more likely to be flaring, um, which again gives us uh, a little bit of insight into which stars should we look for for possible signs of life or habitable planets if we're going down that, that route of science, which ones are going to be really the most habitable. Uh, habitable. So here we can break down those M class flares a little bit more and what's 
is really, really interesting when you break down uh, stellar types. So we have all of the M's across the bottom there. At about an M4, that's when almost the entire star is fully convective. So what happens on the boiler when you have hot water rising and falling, exactly that happens in the star with the plasma. Um, and our sun also has a convective envelope, but it's much, much smaller compared to these M dwarfs. Uh, and so we find that if you have a lot of convection going on, you end up rising in your, in your stellar flares, which is very nice. And then finally, you can figure out how fast are the stars moving around the galaxy? How fast are they tangentially moving through the galactic plane? And we have here the simulated old disk and the simulated young disk. So in our galaxy, if we were to draw a picture of it on the side, um, the young disk is a very thin disk, very close to that galactic plane. Uh, those stars are very young in comparison to some of the other ones, and they have much higher rotational velocities. The older disk are the ones that have been around for quite a few billion years. They've been on a journey, they've been moving, they've lost some kinetic energy, they might have formed in mergers. A lot of things have happened. They're much, they're much older and much more dynamic. And when we fit the type of samples that we find, we find that the, uh, our flares are from these young stellar flares, which is very nice. It just confirms um, physical uh, that was present before our work. Um, so I leave you with um, a thank you and thank you very much for inviting me to talk and I hope that I in, uh, inspired you to love some stars and I welcome any questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was terrific. Um, do we have some uh, questions from the room? Barry. Uh, oh. Sarah, very interesting talk. Yeah, um, am I right in saying that Proxima Centauri is a flare star? Yeah. yeah. Proxima Centauri, we've seen that it does have quite large flares coming off it. Yeah, and it also has some planets hiding yeah, around all, it as all well. Small, small stars that are flare stars, don't they? Most of them. Yeah. yeah, most of them. So even so, what we found, even those very small stars that are much older, so they're on the outskirts of the galactic plane, they still flare. They just flare less frequently. Um, but when they do flare, they lose more of their amplitude. This weird relationship: that for a younger star, you're going to flare more often, but you lose less energy. You're going to release less energy. For an older star, you flare much less, but when you do flare, it's like Krakatoa. Am I right in saying to it, Monash University, when I was tutoring there? But 12 years ago after I retired, came across that. And I think they were worked out that Fox Centauri, in the hapful zone around it, if a planet was in there, the temperature would go up by 60 degrees Celsius a few split seconds a day. Would that be right? Yeah, I'd have to double check, but it would be Thanks believable. very much, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Go to Russell first. Uh, and I agree, uh, uh, Sarah, very, very interesting talk. Thanks very much. Could you just explain to uh, the people here what you mean by a convective envelope oh, in a star, please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, what does, um, so let's take our sun, for example. Our sun has three main layers. Our sun has three main layers. Um, and it's all to do with the way that heat transport is moving around the sun. So if we look at stars on the main sequence, um, to be on the main sequence, you have to be undergoing hydrogen fusion, and that's all in the very center. So in the very, very center, that is where fusion's happening, lots and lots of plasma, very, very, very hot. You then have another area, so you can imagine we could draw a circle. The next region is something called radiative transfer. Most of the photons are moving very, very quickly. So this is a bit like a soup. Everything's moving incredibly quickly, but it's not undergoing the same laws of physics as, um, uh, as convection. So when we put a, a pot of water on the stove, when the heat starts, you see the heat bubbling up, the cold air falling down in the water, and you get those bubbles. That's exactly what is happening on the surface of our sun. Um, so that's why it looks bubbly, is because it really is convection. This plasma is bubbling up. Some of it's really hot, some of it's cooler, and it's falling down. Now, on smaller stars, this can take up the entire sun, um, or the entire star, sorry. So you might have a centre which is technically undergoing hydrogen fusion, good, um, uh, but then it goes, skips straight to that convective envelope. So it has, uh, if you were to break it down in radius, so our sun maybe 
maybe a fourth to a third of the radius of the sun is convection. When a smaller star, it could be 50 to 60% of that radius is convection. And that, when you have a magnetic field combined, um, can, lots of tricky things can happen because if you've got matter moving and changing along those magnetic field lines, um, that's where you get some tricky things. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like cooking in stars. We have one from Facebook. Neil wants to know, with the rise of, the, of big data instruments like the SKA and Vera Rubin, how do you see present and future AI technologies helping to comb through the huge volumes of data they will produce? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And the answer, in my opinion, and I think in almost every astronomer's opinion, is that it's absolutely essential. Um, so gone are the days where astronomers look at their data. We very, very rarely look at our data. So we might take all of these beautiful images of the sky and human eyes might never see them because we have computers doing the analytics for us. And I think, just personally, I think it loses some of the magic of being an astronomer because you'd be an astronomer to find the wonder and to look at the universe. I rarely looked at the universe. When I did, it was because I was, I was a bit bored and a bit sad and I was looking at my images to find pretty galaxies, but not for science. All the computers were doing the science, um, but it is essential because if you're doing really large surveys, there's just, you can't have enough human power to, to look at it until something comes up as interesting. But it's tricky because then you want algorithms to be right because otherwise you might miss something amazing. Actually, mine's pretty simple. Is, is this, are these just restricted to M, 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 M class stars? Yes, that, yes, that's exactly. It. That's yeah. it. And so they don't have very much in temperature then, really. No, the M class stars are very similar temperatures. Yeah. They can happen on um, F and G type stars as well, so similar to our sun and then a little bit smaller with the F type. Um, but yeah, technically any star that's on that main sequence can flare, but the bigger you go, the smaller convective envelope you get, much lower risk. Um, okay, that's it. Yeah. Go down the back now. Uh, hello. Sarah, I'm I'm just a novice uh, astronomer, just taking photos. But um, since uh, you're using this artificial intelligence, yeah. and you're looking at those um, super high energy events, and you're looking at the non-clusterable uh, events as well, is there evidence? of antimatter with what you're looking at? Oh, that's a really cool question. So all of the things that we're looking at would be from the bionic, bi baryonic matter, um, all of that mm. plasma. Um, but antimatter certainly does happen at the cores of stars, uh, cores, core of stars all of the time. Um, but yeah, we're not, uh, we're not seeing any antimatter, unfortunately. It'd be much cooler if we were. <laughs> right, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions? Oh, one more over here. To the great presentation. Um, the study... Exactly, yeah. Anyone looking at what's happening in the non-optical range in, in other parts of the studies going on in that area? Because I'm interested to see how the machine learning develops and teaches itself looking at different kinds of data from the same you know, the same area of space. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. So yes, absolutely looking in different um, ranges. So flare stars are actually really cool when you look in the radio range. Um, so radio light can be polarized or non-polarized. And when we look at data from flare stars in the radio, we tend to see that it suddenly becomes polarized and then not. And we don't exactly know why. We think it's to do with the way the magnetic field breaks. Um, but it is really interesting because some flares completely non-polarized, non, no, no circular polarization, nothing, just happens. Um, and so it is fascinating to combine different energy wavelengths. And that's something with machine learning with those features, because it's just describing a source, whether it's describing a light curve or it could just be a color of a source. Um, you really can build in as many features as you want. So if you have the radio data, that's brilliant. You chuck it in as a feature and you let the higher dimensional sci-fi space figure out why is that important? Um, and things like that really do work. It is really, really cool. No more questions? One last one. Um, sorry, just, uh, just to your last point there. Is it, so is it similarly coordinated as you're doing with the gravitational wave um, sort of studies where you're doing optical and obviously all the radio telescopes are looking at the same spot? Is it the same sort of coordination? Yeah, so with the, the gravitational wave, um, 
uh, coordinating around that is quite difficult because you have to wait until there's an event or yep. an alert sure. to then mm. find it. But yes, mm. absolutely. Once you have an event and an alert, and now with LIGO and Virgo, we get a nice little patch of the sky that you can mm. chase. Um, all of yeah, all of the telescopes but try but to look at the same spot. But your flares are lasting longer so that you've got more time to coordinate it, basically. Yeah, no, yeah, gotcha. absolutely. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. No worries. Thank you again, Sarah. Um, that's terrific. And uh, we've just invited Sarah and her partner up to the LMDSS for the star party to come and get some of the, the wonders of the universe back with uh, some op good optical telescopes. So, um, yeah. And uh, I'm sure that we'll see many of you up there at uh, the star party. We're back to star parties face to face. Incredible. Wonderful. And uh, the other interesting bit of news that crossed my desk today was that uh, they're actually going to try and launch uh, the Webb Space Telescope on the 22nd. But I did notice that they hadn't put the year behind the date. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the 22nd we'll actually see that take off for space. So, um, fingers crossed, at last, at long last. Thank you. Now, I'm sure you all know Ken Lamarquand. He's going to take us around the night sky tonight and uh, show us a few things that we may be able to see on Saturday, always assuming the clouds play ball. And if it is, that it was Chris that said the cloud word, not me. <laughs> um, thank you, Sarah. I've always wondered why a, a lower energy M-class star was a flare star, and I think your explanation tonight, the light bulb finally went off in my head, so thank you. Um, I've been busy doing my own things and unfortunately missed Mark's email that I'm presenting tonight, so I found out as I walked in the door. <laughs> so we're going to improvise a little bit down here. I'll start where, where our sky is at. Um, we're looking directly south and do we have a pointer at all? No? I, I, I brought one with me. Um, <laughs> we have the Southern Cross scraping the bottom of the sky down south at the moment um, and we've got the two pointers off to the right hand side um, we also have off to the right it's a funny now I know what um, Perry talks about it's a funny angle trying to read it upside down in the screen we also have the um, false cross up on the far left hand side and next to it the diamond cross on the other side mark yep the diamond cross so we have three crosses in a row um, these are going to be pretty low but if you're staying up after midnight they might start um, appearing above the trees um, but the way to pick the Southern Cross is it's the only one with the two pointers. Now, I've just finished writing an article for the New Astronomers Group about dividing the sky up into five zones. And the idea of dividing it into five zones is to work out what to look at first. So the five zones, the first four are your cardinal direction, so north, east, west, south, and the fifth one is straight above. So the first zone you want to prioritise is anything setting in the west, if you're out looking at the west. So could we scroll around to the west, the other west? <laughs> here it comes, here it comes. So we've got um, Jupiter, Saturn and Venus in the west and Venus is by far the brightest of the three planets there. Um, that's going to be fairly low and you'll see a crescent phase 
to Venus. You don't actually get to see details on the disk itself. Um, but Saturn and Jupiter have been through a conjunction. They're starting to head for the west. So um, these December, January, you're, you're probably the last month to have a chance to look at Saturn and Jupiter before they start heading for the um, horizon towards the sun. Um, and then you're going to have a new moon. It'll probably be further up to the right um, in a few days. It'll probably be out in the northwest of the sky. So that'll be up for a little while to have a look at with the um, telescope first. The other thing in this area, uh, actually I won't, I was going to say have a look at the helix, but with the moon there, it might be um, blotty, yeah, it's going to be right in the way of the helix. So let's scrub that, let's scrub that. Um, so the west is the first zone to look at. The other zone to look at is anything in the north, because as we know, we're down in the south. If we're in Victoria, we're between 34 and 38 degrees latitude. So our things in the north don't get very high. And we can see a few targets here. So when it gets directly above our north here, which is very hard to see amongst the trees, we, I've never seen the north little marker, um, we have a couple of targets. This is probably your last chance to see Andromeda. Um, if you're getting up to the Starbucks, and if you align yourself on the track between the two observing fields, you can see down a little bit lower along the Andromeda track there. So Andromeda and a little bit higher up is Triangulum. Um, if you're looking for another planet, we've got um, Uranus up a bit higher, um, and the best way to um, plot that is on your star atlas. You um, put a little sticky note um, with a little, draw a little black dot on your sticky note and stick it where Uranus is going to be on the Saturday night. So when you get up there, you can run your hand across the map, find your little sticky note and that's where Uranus is going to be. But it's not particularly near any bright stars at the moment. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be hard, but you could um, go off the... There's three stars up above it, and then you've got um, Triangulum itself down further to try to get into that zone in the middle. Yeah, so here's Triangulum in here, Uranus, and then you've got the head of Cetus, is it? I'm not sure. Um, and of course, um, if you are looking for something really, really low, um, a bit, a couple of hours later, you might be able to get M1 down in the legs, in the horns of the bull, as it comes up a bit later, it's not going to show, but it'll be up in here somewhere. Maybe if we zoom in. Um, we'll go up to Orion. There are so many things to see in Orion. But there's a nice little thing that I talk to the new astronomers group when we're talking about double stars. Are we able to zoom in on the handle of Orion, the, the, three, the three stars? Is zoom possible without a, without a mouse? Or maybe the plus and minus? Does the plus and minus keep no, it doesn't. Uh, maybe a control plus or minus. Oh, here we go. Pinch and squeeze. Whoa! 
So this might be a bit tricky. <laughs> I, I've picked a, a bad night. Um, okay, so if, if we're looking at the handle, we've got the three stars in the handle. The one in the middle is the um, Orion Nebula, but the, the next one up above it, where we can see it now, this, that third star, you can just pick out that naked eye as a double star. If you zoom in with a pair of binoculars, that top of the three stars, that one to the left, that one, yep, will split into a double with a pair of binoculars. I don't know if Mark will be able to do that. Um, it will split into a nice double. There it goes. Oh, this is excellent. Now, if you then go to a telescope and pick the top one of those two, I don't know if Stellarium will show it, um, but you will be able to split that with about 150 times of magnification. Oh, it's just starting, or oh, it's trying to split. So you have a visual double, a binocular double, and a telescope double all nicely layered there. So if you're learning what double stars are and you want to see the different levels, that's an interesting one to go have a look at. Um, now just up above Orion, we have Lepus the Hare. Um, could you zoom out and do a find on um, Heinz? Heinz Crimson, H-I-N-D-S, yep, not the beans, Heinz Crimson Star, it's just up in, now this is, if anyone's gone and have had a look at the Southern Cross and had a look at Mimosa, which is um, one of the stars on the side, and zoomed in, it's a very easy find to find a crimson star. Um, so these are carbon stars. And this one is the diametrically opposite. Crux is right down on the horizon, but this one is up nice and high. But this is a real star hop challenge to find this because there's no real good stars around it, but if you go have a look at this Heinz Crimson star and, and just sort of imprint the colour in your mind and then quickly jump over to um, Betelgeuse, you'll see how red this is compared to the orange of Betelgeuse. So you're looking at a carbon star versus a, um, a red giant star. So it's a really hard find, but when you get it, and I tend to start um, down on this star here, and then follow these little stars up the edge, and, and you get almost a, um, a, a you get sort of a square with a with an odd corner, and then you've got a, that jump off to like that little crux. Now these are fairly faint stars to find in the finder scope, and I usually resort to the widest field um, eyepiece I have got to try to do that star hop, but it is really worthwhile if you're looking for a, a different sort of challenge. Um, is that enough? So there's a, a few different things to look at. So look in the West first, anything doing that bump, getting near the meridian line that's going to only be there for an hour or two in the north. Things down in the south, um, you've got the whole circumpolar region, so once it's up, it's up for a long time. In the west, you want to wait till they're 20, 30 degrees up, so you can wait a few hours, so that's your past midnight stuff. 
Directly overhead is your butter zone. That's the best zone for looking at things with the telescope. That's where you're going to see the most detail in planets. You're going to put your high power eyepiece in and it will work if it's a good night and split those closer double stars. You can't do that down on the hor horizon. So thank you. Thank you, Ken. You forgot one thing. Sorry. Um, there is a comet coming, but it's not going to be there because of the star barbecue. Um, I don't know a lot about it other than it's Comet Leonard, I think. The Christmas Comet. Yeah, Christmas Comet. So it's going to be there at the end of December coming up from the west. I think the predictions are around fifth magnitude, um, but I'm not up to date with it. Somebody in the audience might know more. Microphone going? Just going to hand the mic over to Perry, who will know a bit about this comet. You know about it. No, we don't. Um, comet Leonard will be visible in the west uh, around the 15th or 16th, just near where Venus is, and it'll slowly climb. Well, actually, it's not so slow. It'll make a fairly quick climb up over the next uh, successive few nights. So it should be pretty well visible around the 18th, 17th, 18th, and getting better. So look close to where Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter are. You can use binoculars. You'll be able to pick it out and uh, see whether in fact the predictions do hold true and it does get brighter. Sometimes comments can be a little bit disappointing. They're a bit like cats. They both have tails and they do whatever they want. So we may get lucky and get a good view. On the other hand, uh, we may not. Best of luck to everyone with it. Thank you. Now, Chris, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we close out for the evening? We have, we have one, thing. one thing that we have really been missing for this past 21 months, and that is uh, the library. And uh, Barry Cleland has been on my back the whole time, how can, we, how can we open the library? He has been itching to get this library open again. So Barry, for the first time in 21 months, come and give us a quick library report. It's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> Never been through that before. Yeah, well, we are opening the library again after the meeting, of course, like we always do. And the other two, Johns and myself, will be going to the library about a quarter of an hour after we finish the meeting, after we've had a cup of coffee. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff we've still got to put in the library. And, and <laughs> oh, but there's two great courses, DVDs, DVD sets, and the books that go into the library. And that will make 39 sets of great courses, series of lectures, and they're brilliant, will be in the library. There you are. So I, I, I could bore you to death for another half an hour, but I won't. Now that'll do, I think. So, right. What have we got there? So, and the I'll first make, one. I'll make an announcement. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, well, I'll get up here and make an announcement when we're ready to go to the library. You can follow me there if you want to. Uh, hopefully, you won't need an umbrella. We don't know, do we? <laughs> oh, one of them. What are they? What have we got? The last one we got, got only a few months ago. Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy by Dr. Emily Levesque. Um, in it, it's got, it's got a, a bit, few story bits of some of the famous women in astronomy. And I'm not going to bore you, bore you for an hour about fame. There's an article I put in crux on that. Understanding the Misconceptions of Science by Dr. Lincoln. 
can't remember his name. Yeah, Don Lincoln. Um, I'm, 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 I, I could go on for it, I won't, but that's enough. But we, we, we've got to get someone to copy these here and put them in the library, the copies in the library. We don't loan these out. And the transcript book and the, the books that go with it. All right, let you go. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much for coming. It is lovely to see you all here. I hope to see many of you uh, up in uh, Ladies Pass at our LMDSS very shortly. So that's what I was going to talk about. <laughs> so we have, uh, as Chris said, the Starbecue this weekend. So if you haven't bought tickets, those of you online watching, if you haven't bought tickets, there are still some tickets left for general public and some tickets left for the members. We also still have tickets for the raffle. Um, they were going out the door today <laughs> in batches of 10, which is great to see, which is an Ioptron CEM26B equatorial centre balanced mount with stainless steel tripod, a Skywatcher Evo Star 72 ED telescope, uh, a 0.85 focal reducer for the ED72, a 12 volt uh, switch mode power supply with a cigarette lighter socket, uh, an M48T mount for a Canon EOS or an M48T mount for a Nikon, uh, all supplied by Sidereal Trading. Raffle value is $3,124 and includes fully insured delivery to whoever wins it. So the raffle is open till about 6 o'clock on Saturday. So if you haven't got tickets or if you've got some tickets and you want more, you can still grab some. Um, other things happening is January next year we have our first 100 year celebration event, a slideshow extravaganza. Ticket information is on our website and our Facebook page. It's a three course dinner event uh, on the 31st of January and it, it will involve a uh, viewing of the astronomical glass plate slide collection that uh, we have through the original projector. Um, we're talking about images uh, from the 1870s through to about the 1930s of uh, nebula, galaxies, star clusters, um, the moon, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, you name it. Uh, these are all amazing slides. Um, do you have anything else to add before I close it out for us? And amazing beer. <laughs> yes, the venue, the venue, uh, they're a, a, a high quality food venue. Uh, it's at Deeds Brewing in Glen Iris. Um, they've been gracious enough to uh, allow us to use the venue. Uh, and uh, tickets are currently on sale, uh, that there's only 100 tickets available at this point in time. Uh, thank you for joining us for the November Astro Talk, uh, machine learning in astronomy and using it to find fast uh, flowing stars. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, and if you're not a member, for those watching at home, if you're not a member yet, become a member, uh, asv.org.au forward slash join. Uh, as Barry said, for those of you who are here, the library will be open after we have uh, Christmas supper. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you at our next stream and meeting.